Hi everyone, my name is Samantha Hill. I'm the assistant director of the HANA RN Center. Welcome to our virtual reading group. Can everyone hear me okay? Can I get some thank you? Yes, Howard? yes. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Um, so today we're going to be discussing HANA Arendt's essay, Personal Responsibility Under Dictatorship. So if everyone can hear me all right, I'm just going to get us started with um, uh, some opening introduction um remarks um and hopefully touch on a few things that i didn't get a chance to talk about in the introductory video so Arendt begins this essay she wrote it in 1964 and she begins the essay by reflecting upon the controversy that sprung up around her um, eichmann in jerusalem a report on the banality of evil um, thinking about the variety of criticism that she received um, and thinking about the different forms of criticism raised a number of questions about moral responsibility and judgment. So the question that Arendt, I want to suggest that Arendt really lays before us in this essay is ultimately a question of judgment and the relationship between judging and thinking. She begins the essay by asking who has the right to judge and who has the ability to judge. Um, and from there, she's going to draw a distinction between legal issues and moral issues, um, saying that in, in nowhere are they the same thing, but they have an affinity with one another because they both presuppose the power of judgment. And this distinction between moral issues and legal issues becomes essential to the way that she's going to lay out the relationship between thinking and judging. <clears throat> You're gonna have to bear with me a little, I'm wrestling with a head cold. So technically speaking, um, in a certain way, everything the Nazi regime did was legal, right? Because they were obeying the laws of the Fuhrer. And Eichmann did not commit a crime in the sense that we would normally accuse someone of committing a crime or of breaking the law. Um, but obviously what he did was wrong, was, was horribly wrong. And that wrong is a moral judgment then, but it's not a legal one. So how do we hold someone personally accountable for violating a moral code for, for making such a horrible decision, horrible personal decision. And part of the problem with beginning to answer these questions is that Eichmann didn't violate the normative moral order of, of society, the society that we share in common. The phenomenal appearance of Totalitarian, totalitarianism, Arendt tells us, exploded the moral order of society. All of the pre-existing moral categories and standards of judgment um, that we had were gone, um, which in part means that there can be no adequate punishment or judgment or forgiveness within the, the normal framework as we, would, as we would usually conceive of it. And so there was this near universal breakdown of personal judgment. And she says in the early days of the Nazi regime, it's impossible to understand what actually happened um, because society, society disintegrated. And so she goes on to draw a distinction between personal responsibility and political responsibility. If we want to get to this question of judgment and how one judges and who has the ability to judge, um, we have to start by thinking about the difference between personal responsibility and political responsibility. And to a certain extent, we all bear political responsibility, but we cannot take personal responsibility for the sins of others. You cannot feel guilty for something that you have not done. And this is important because it becomes an example of the complete collapse of the moral order for RN. Those who did nothing wrong felt guilty, and those who did everything wrong felt no guilt. So why didn't Eichmann feel guilty? <coughs> in part because he claimed he was a cog in the, mach in, in the machine, right? Uh, what she calls the her cog theory. Um, he was a mere functionary. And Arendt argues that this excuse is a kind of lie that no one, that, that no one really accepted. If everyone actually thought that Eichmann was just a cog in the machine, then the trial wouldn't have been so interesting to so many, to so many people. And so 
stepping back then, how do we think about the nature of a legal, a legal regime like the Nazi Reich? And how do we think about someone like Eichmann who played a role um, in the machine? And how do we begin to judge his actions as someone who bears personal responsibility and not, not just political responsibility? Um, it, okay. And so this is where, this is, I skipped over this part in the intro video. This is where she draws a distinction between um, totalitarianism and dictatorship, which does a bit of theoretical work for her in this essay. And I think is a, is a question that might have come up in our discussion last week of we refugees about the difference between fascism and dictatorship and totalitarianism in her work. So she begins by drawing a distinction between totalitarian forms of governments and dictatorships um, in order to highlight primarily two differences that she sees between these different forms. Um, the first is that in dictatorship, in, in modern dictatorships, there remains a sense of political activity, right? And this is really important. Um, for the for, for thinking which comes back later on um, whereas under a totalitarian regime the social and the private are completely extinguished alongside political freedom right so totalitarianism collapses the private and the social and the public and the political so that one could not tell um, the difference between them. Um, and We Refugees, which we talked about last week, she gives a really, um, I think, potent example of this when she says that individuals lost the ability to walk down the street and buy a loaf of bread. That in itself became a political act under a totalitarian regime. So the second, the second difference that she draws our attention to is um, she says that since a dictatorship is still in a sense a legitimate state, right, that there are clearly enemies of the, of the state, of the regime who pose a threat and they are charged as political enemies for committing crimes against the state. Whereas the crimes of totalitarian governments concern people who were innocent. Right. Even from the viewpoint of the party in power, the Nazi regime didn't think that the Jewish people had committed a crime. Right. They hadn't done anything. They hadn't done anything wrong, um, which is why she she says that those who were em those who emigrated into um, new countries were not stamped as political refugees. Um, they had not committed a political crime, which is where she started, um, we refugees. So under totalitarianism, domination reaches into all spheres of life. And Arendt says that only those who withdraw from public life altogether, who refuse political responsibility, could avoid becoming implicated in the Nazi regime, could avoid legal and moral responsibility. So she asks, how is it that some people were able to do this? How is it that some people were able to withdraw altogether, were able to refuse to participate in public life? And then on the flip side of that, why is it that people like Eichmann, who is not a monster, behaved the way that he did? And so here she comes back to judging and she ties the argument together and lays out a relationship between thinking and judging, which I think is really essential to, to her work. Um, those who did not participate were the only ones who dared to judge themselves, she says, right? And they were capable of doing so, not because they had a better system of values than anyone else, or because they still had a sense of the old standards of the right and wrong, um, but because they were, she says, firmly planted in their minds. They asked themselves to what extent they would still be able to live in peace with themselves um, after having committed certain deeds and acts. And they decided that it would be better to do nothing because that was the only way that they could go on living with themselves. They refused to murder not because or be complicit in murder, not because they had a great moral belief in thou shalt not kill, right, as a moral imperative, but because they didn't want to live with a murderer, 
they didn't want to live with themselves as a murderer. So those who did not participate, she says, wanted to think. She says they wanted to think. I think it's a really powerful line. And that those who did participate did not think. They chose not to think, right? Um, thinking for Arun is this really rich conceptual category, which is where she ends the origins of totalitarianism, turning us to that internal dialogue, which she calls the two-in-one, where we come into conversation with ourselves and so here we we see her unfolding the negative judgment of the power of thinking in relationship to totalitarianism those who want to think realize that they have to enter into this space of self-reflective critical judgment where they engage in conversation with themselves and if you stop and think about what that means it forces you to ask, who do you want to be talking with when you go home at the end of the day and you're talking with yourself? Do you want to be talking with somebody who has made these decisions? Um, and we, I think in this we see the the fuller side of the, 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 I don't know, it fills out the banality of evil argument, right, which claims that Eichmann didn't think, he refused to think, he couldn't think, right? And here she's giving us an example of what it means to actually think and what the moral implications are for thinking in itself. I'm gonna stop there. I wanna open it up to conversation. There's a lot going on in this essay. Um, and I, let me move over to the chat box. Bob wants to know if anyone wants to go to the MoMA this week to see Tanya Ruggera's exhibit which got a wonderful write-up in the Miami Herald. I encourage everyone to go. I'm gonna try and make it. Um, so if you wanna meet up with Bob in the city um, this weekend. I, I, would, just add, I yep. would just add that um, she's a big fan of Hannah Arendt's and uh, yes. tried, tried to read Origins in Havana yep. and was shut down by the police. Tanya Bruguera is the NEH fellow at the Hannah Arendt Center this year. Um, she actually just finished a wonderful writing workshop with um, a group of Bard students, and she is a, a big, uh, she really engages Arendt's work as a means or vehicle to political protest in, in Cuba, and she's a wonderful political artist. So I encourage everyone to go to the MoMA. Daphna writes, Eichmann in Jerusalem introduces the conflict between legal and moral in the personal responsibility essay about Eichmann. Aaron says he did his duty. He not only obeyed orders, he also obeyed the law. Daphne, do you want to add something to that? Do you want to say something? No, I just was it was in my head as you as as I read this chapter that you know it was very striking that particular line says it all doesn't it yeah it's the law to do what he was doing and so yeah yeah and this is I think it's um it's a really important distinction that she's drawing in this essay between legal issues and moral issues and thinking about the what happens when you live in a society where what is legal is unthinkable, is immoral, is, is fundamentally wrong. Um, how do you as an individual take personal responsibility um, in, in under dictatorship in this kind of, in this kind of society? Um, at the end of the essay, she, she, she says, you know, the people in normal society that we would consider good upstanding citizens who follow the rule of law and, you know, have a good moral moral sense are not the people we want on our side um, in a dictatorship, right? Those are the people who are just going to go along uh, with the rules and do what they're told and, and be good citizens. Um, what, we, what we want are the skeptics. Right, the civil disobedience, the people who are willing to step back and question 
whether or not the legal order um, is broken, is broken in such a way that it, it fundamentally violates um, our ability to judge right from right from wrong. Um, and it's yeah. totally relevant to us today, isn't it? This this article is so completely relevant to us today. So, yeah, it's just so hard to know what stand to take or how to actually combat the total insanity that's going on. It's um, I I think that I I have the personal sense that that's right. Um, I don't think we live in a totalitarian society um, or an, under a dictatorship in any way. Yes. Is, as despicable as we might find um, Trump and, uh, and 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 certain parts of the Republican Party these days, um, but you know we still live in a society which maintains the rule of law, and we still I think it actually makes it more difficult in a certain in a certain respect, or it makes it difficult, not more difficult, but it makes it difficult um, when we live in a society. Um, that is fully functioning, right, in a kind of normative way where we have social values and mores and we have, um, you know, 3% of the population participated in acts of civil disobedience last year, which is absolutely phenomenal, unheard of. Um, we have uh, members of the Democratic Party who are, are, you know, organizing and Nancy Pelosi standing for eight hours trying to, you know, tell the story of immigrants on the House floor, we have people who are trying to um, trying to engage in in I think in in personal and and political political responsibility um, in a thoughtful way, in a self reflective way. Um, but I wonder, I mean, I don't, I wonder if in in our American society today. You know, what our standards of judgment are for saying, um, you know, this is right or this is wrong, or it was wrong for DACA to be excluded from the House bill that passed at 630 in the morning. What do we mean when we make that kind of moral judgment? Where do we make it from? What kind of center? Um, who are we in conversation with when, when we make those kinds of judgments about what should or should not be? Um, where and I, my, my worry is that today a lot of those judgments come from a place of um, not of not of critical self-reflective critical thought in the way that Arendt is pushing us to think, but from a place of identity politics, which is a very loaded word. Um, but from uh, you know we join political organizations, we join groups, we listen to. NPR, we um, are all, we're situated in, um, we situate ourselves in uh, media and news and contexts that affirm how we think politically. Not everyone does this, but I think that it's become, there are, I'm going to go over to the chat box, unless anyone wants to comment on that. Yeah, I wanted to just jump in for a second because I wonder where Arendt, where does she base, how does she base this decision that people who um, did not, were not complicit, who did not participate, did so based on this self-reflection as opposed to uh, moral beliefs? I don't understand. As opposed to, as opposed to what? Moral beliefs. She's saying people who did not participate, it was not because of their moral beliefs, but where where does she, well, how does she base that? I'm not sure. Well, I think, she, I think she's being rhetorical when she says that. So at the beginning of the essay, she says that we can no longer take the Socratic axiom that it is better to suffer wrong than do wrong for granted, right? Um, that, no longer applies in a society in which the moral and political order has been exploded. And I think at the end of the essay, when she says that people, it was the people who chose to think, let me pull up the passage. So, She 
says the dividing line between those who want to think and therefore have to judge by themselves and those who do not strike across all social and cultural or educational differences. In this respect, the total moral collapse of respectable society during the Hitler regime may teach us that under such circumstances, those who cherish values and hold fast to moral norms and standards are not reliable. We now know that moral norms and standards can be changed overnight, and that all that then will be left is the mere habit of holding fast to something. Much more reliable will be the doubters and skeptics. Much more reliable will be the mere habit of holding fast to something, right? So it doesn't matter. The moral standards of judgment don't matter anymore, is what she's saying. I think which is really hard to, really hard to, um, to think about because we all carry with us a certain sense of right and wrong, wherever it might come from. But her question is, well, if we no longer have the conceptual um, tools for moral judgment, a sense of this is right, this is wrong, it is better to suffer wrong than to do wrong, thou shalt not kill, right? If these things no longer apply, if we can't use them in order to make decisions, then what do we as individuals have access to in order to make moral judgments? And for her, the answer to that question is thinking, right? And so that's what she offers in place of, because just having a sense of right or wrong wasn't enough, which she says we clearly saw in the com complete collapse of German society. Um, so where do individuals get the facility to make moral judgments to discern from at the end of the day, um, moral judgments can can is it turn on a dime, drop on a dime, turn on a dime, right? They can change really <laughs> overnight. Um, but thinking is something that we can engage in. It's a self-reflective process that puts us in conversation with ourselves and forces us to hold ourselves accountable. In a, in, in a society where the political, moral, and legal order might not be holding us accountable. Can I, can I say something? Yes, go for it. She definitely. starts the book by saying that there was a furious uproar caused by the publication of Eichmann in Jerusalem. Um, and it's interesting, or it makes it even harder to fathom because in many of her other writings, she condemned the readers of her book to having um, a lack of understanding of what it is she's saying, a lack mm -hmm. of judgment as to why they are staging this uh, document of history that Ben-Gurion and his cohorts were intentionally bringing in Eichmann so that they could create the history of the suffering of the Jews for the world at large, even though bringing Eichmann to Israel for this trial was illegal, um, and that really it had very little to do with the guilt or innocence of the man Eichmann, whom she said was a banal bureaucrat. So right. already there, it's people who have been to some extent brainwashed to believe in one narrative and as soon as she comes and tries to deconstruct that narrative by saying, okay, yeah. we're not going to use this as a staging ground for the history of the suffering of the Jews, but rather we're going to use this as a real trial of, of the, you know, the, the hor horrible the man. Cause. Yeah, the man Eichmann. People thought that she herself was guilty of anti-Semitism. And I know people even today Jews who, you know, may be intellectuals who will condemn Hannah Arendt as a mm -hmm. Nazi sympathizer. So already you have that conflict between being able to think and being able to, and being very quick to judge, implicit in the very writing of the Eichmann book, which I think is yep. fascinating. Thank you. That was a that was a beautiful dissection of the the opening 
of I'm the writing book. a book myself um, about the dissenters of the Zionist narrative. It's my second book. And oh. in this book, uh, a major portion of that is about this particular part of Hannah Arendt's uh, opus, mm -hmm. the, the narrative about the Eichmann trial and the responses to it. So it's very close to my um, whatever consciousness. Anyway, sorry if I talked too yes. much. No, no, no. That was that was fantastic. Um, she she starts this essay there in order. She's making a judgment about the judgments that she received, um, trying to understand why people became so furious with her for judging Eichmann, the man, um, and not for all of history um, in itself. Uh, let's. I want to go over. Will, um, okay, so I want to just jump over to the chat box. So Will, uh, you said I'm confused a little. Is our, is our choice in a totalitarian society only either complicity or no participation? Can't see how that is possible, but, or civil disobedience as distinct from a dictatorship. Do you want to um, say something about the question or Will, uh? Only, yes, only uh, this, that um, uh, during your um, preliminary discussion, and then today, <clears throat> um, I was having, conf I, I was confused, uh, but I thought you clarified that in a dictatorship, uh, one still had the capacity to uh, function within that dictatorship without being complicit. Unlike a uh, totalitarian society where um, it's impossible to do that because of the collapse of uh, social and moral and legal and so on. But now I was confused by what you said. Does it, does it also apply to a dictatorship in, in uh, thinking? Uh, do we truly have options in a dictatorship? Mm -hmm. Um. So let me. Um. Let's look at the. I want to look at the passage together, um, where she draws the distinction. But one. Of, I think to to the first part of your question. One of the in the first distinction she draws between a dicta dictatorship and a totalitarian society. Um, in a dictatorship the space for thinking is preserved. Um, she says, in a dictatorship, political freedom is gone, but there still exists a private realm of life and to a certain extent, a social sphere that individuals can function in without um, being part participating in implicitly or complicitly with the regime. Whereas in a totalitarian society, all the realms of life collapse in upon one another, and even the private sphere of existence um, becomes an oppressive political space um, where thinking isn't possible. And Origins, toward the end when she's talking about loneliness, she talks about how the collapse of the private in upon the public forecloses the the space for thinking in order to engage in the kind of thinking that she's describing as a form of self-reflective critical judgment one has to be able to appear in the world <coughs> publicly as much as they um, then go home at the end of the day and can have a completely private life um, and engage in a conversation with them themselves and bring in the world with them. Um, but in a totalitarian society, there is no private realm. Um, there is no space of retreat. Um, one can never escape the, the public, um, can never escape the political. And this had horrible consequences, she argues, for, for thinking. Um, so if we look at the passage um, on the distinction between totalitarianism and dictatorship, 
she says, totalitarian forms of government and dictatorships in the usual sense are not the same. And most of what I have to say applies to totalitarianism. I think somebody, somebody's sharing their email. Um, Dan? Dictatorship in the old Roman sense of the word was devised and has remained an emergency measure of constitutional lawful government. What page strictly are you limited on? Until in, in time and power. We still know it well enough as the state of emergency or of martial law proclaimed in disaster areas or in times of war. She's comparing states of emergency to dictatorships and the powers of um, a dictatorship within a constitutional lawful society. We further know modern dictatorships as new forms of government, where either the military sees power or abolish civilian government and deprive the citizens of their political rights and liberties, or where one party seizes the state apparatus at the expense of all other parties and hence of all pol organized political opposition. Both types spell the end of political freedom, but private life and non-political activity are not necessarily touched. It is true that these regimes usually persecute political opponents with great ruthlessness, and they are certainly and they certainly are very far from being constitutional forms of government in the sense we have come to understand them. Right. She says, if they commit crimes, they are not, they are directed against the outspoken foes of the regime in power. But the crimes of totalitarian governments concerned people who were innocent, even from the viewpoint of the party in power. And it was for this reason of common criminality that most countries signed an agreement after the war not to bestow the status of political refugee, right? So, and then a little bit further down, just to add, she says, for the simple truth of the matter is that only those who withdrew from public life altogether, who refused political responsibility of any sort, could avoid becoming implicated in crimes. That is, could avoid legal and moral responsibility. And then that's where on the bottom of page 35, then she transitions into the conversation about the lesser of two evils. Um, so for her, within a totalitarian society, the only option that individuals have is to not participate in society at all. Um, and the only way one can get to that place of non-participation is by engaging in this form of self-reflective critical thinking. Um, if we want to look at the very end of the text, Willa, is this helping? Should I keep going? It, it is, Sam. I, I, um, uh, I, I think I'm no longer confused. So if, if, if <laughs> well, for so, one. Um, <laughs> For a little while. Um, For a little while. If, you, if you don't care to proceed, that's fine with me. No, no, no. I want. I think this is fantastic. So I just, I want to look, I want, if we go to the very end um, okay. of, of the text on 47 and 48, um, she says, in these terms, right, she's talking about those who um, participate and those who do not participate. Um, she says, in these terms, the non-participants Non-participators in public life under a dictatorship are those who have refused their support by shunning those places of responsibility where such support under the name of obedience is required. And we have only for a moment to imagine what would happen to any of these forms of government if enough people would act irresponsibly and refuse support even without active resistance and rebellion to see how effective a weapon this could be. It is, in fact, one of the many variations of nonviolent action and resistance. For instance, the power that is potential in civil disobedience, which are being discovered in our century. The reason, however, that we can hold these new criminals who never committed a crime out of their own initiative, nevertheless responsible for what they did, is that there is no such thing as obedience in political and moral matters. There's no such thing as simply obeying political or moral orders. One does not, this is, she says, this, this language of obeying is wrong, right? Um, the only domain where the word could possibly apply to, adult, to adults who are not slaves 
is the domain of religion, in which people say that they obey the word or the command of God, because the relationship between God and man can rightly be seen in terms similar to the relationship between adult and child. Hence the question to those who participated and obeyed order should be, why did you obey? Not, never, never be, why did you obey? But should be, why did you support? This change of words is no semantic irrelevancy for those who know the strange and powerful influence mere words have over the minds of men who, first of all, are speaking animals. Much would be granted if we could eliminate the pernicious word obedience from our vocabulary of moral and political thought. If we think these matters through, we might regain some measure of self-confidence and even pride, that is, regain what former times called the dignity or the honor of man, not perhaps of mankind, but of the status of human being. Right? She's giving, she's, she's offering us a new language of morality within the context of politics. If the reason Eichmann was able to claim that he was a mere functionary, a cog, that he was just obeying orders, right, um, is for her in, entirely false. It assumes the wrong philosophical ground he participated in, and by participation in, it means that he supported, right, and so she's, she's also right. plurality, right, and the essential um, notion of plurality, right, a group of people obey commands or obey orders or, you know, children obey their parents, but individuals support, right, we make a decision about whether or not we just support a cause, a person, a thing, um, and that requires us to think, right, whereas obeying is this um, form of uh, obeisance comes to mind, and I don't want to say not thinking, but it's a way of deferral. It's a way of deferring the question of responsibility. Whereas if we ask why someone chose to support, we're forcing them to claim a sense of um, personal responsibility. I want to jump in again, go back to something Daphne said about where we are Susan? now. Yeah, yeah. Because I don't think we have the option to withdraw. I mean, there's really no way to withdraw. Not that we're not that we're dealing with totalitarianism, but you know, we're watching people be deported every single day. Absolutely. And, and so withdrawing from that does not seem to be an option. Um, for anybody who thinks that this is not a good thing. So I'm not sure, you know, whether her formula is that helpful for, for now. Well, I, I, think, I think if we follow it through to the end of the essay, um, it, she, gives, she gives us, um, she gives us, I don't want to say options, but she holds up civil disobedience, right? She holds up skepticism and civil disobedience and um, illegality, um, being an outlaw, right? Um, acting outside of the law when the law is wrong or oppressive um, as ways of engaging in personal responsibility um, and political responsibility. Um, we're having the uh, annual fall conference in October on citizenship and civil disobedience, which is going to be wonderful. Um, and in her essay, Civil Disobedience, which is about the American context specifically, she it lays out how it is that civil disobedience, acting outside of the law in order to make a political argument or to hold the government accountable and responsible for its actions, is the oldest form of citizenship that Americans can practice. It's embedded into the um, Declaration of Independence, right? Um, I mean, which raises a lot of moral questions. If we take your example of immigration, um, I know a number of people who are, you know, organizing to keep certain individuals safe. Um, we have 
cities and towns that are trying to do the same thing. And there's a question of legality. Um, what happens if you help an immigrant who's about to be deported avoid ICE? Can I just jump in for one right. more? Um, in Israel right now, they're deporting yeah. um, Somalian and Ethiopian refugees. Yes. And uh, I don't know if you've followed this, but uh, yeah. Holocaust survivors living in Israel have vowed to hide these refugees in their own homes. Okay. Sort of a repeat of what happened before. The question is, in Israel, it is definitely illegal now to hide. And in fact, the government is offering a bounty price on revealing where these refugees are hiding. Well, How do you object to a regime that is becoming incredibly repetitive <clears throat> and an incipient totalitarian regime? Well, <laughs> I have no answer. I'm expecting you to find the answer. I'm just struggling with my own. I would probably have a different job if I had an answer to that, Daphna. Um, I, I, I think it's, um, I, I would re, I would reword the last part of what you said in an Arendtian spirit. I, I don't think, I think the question I get asked more often than not is America becoming a totalitarian society? Um, and the stock answer that I've developed is America is is not a totalitarian society, and I, do, I don't think it's becoming one, but there are certainly elements of totalitarianism that are alive and well in the United States. Um, the prospect of military parades and the daily deportations are two examples um, of things that kind of smack of, uh, of an illiberal, um, regime right so i think and brainwashing well i think i think in the example that you give which is similar to what we're watching in the united states there's the personal there's the question of personal responsibility and there's a question of, of political responsibility what can we as individuals do to protest to be civil disobedience um to act outside of the law in order to do what we judge to be the right thing so that at the end of the day when we go home um we can we're 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 okay with who it is we are as individuals that we like the person that we're spending most of our time with right and that's the question of personal responsibility um so maybe that means organizing underground or helping to hide people or risking um, your own freedom uh, in order to help other people preserve theirs. Okay. Um, and politically, it means holding the government accountable for its actions, um, for not reflecting the will of the people. I think the reality is that even in the United States, you know, we don't live in a democratic society. We live in a constitutional republic, and it's um, it, it's it's difficult to hold our representatives um, and elected officials accountable for the public policies that they pass. And oftentimes, those policies are, I think, more often than not, reflective of the will of the people. They're not. Um, <laughs> Let's go over Bob. Well, this I think this this echoes of Bob's question. What does anyone think about the efficacy of moral teaching or just plain thinking in bringing about moral behavior? Kant thought that you couldn't implant a good heart in a person. Is that true? Is that so? Do you want to say something about your question, Bob? Or do you want me to just respond? Um, well, I, I was um, I was wondering uh, if in Aaron's essay uh, there was this tension or contradiction between somebody <coughs> like, uh, like Eichmann, who was uh, thought in cliches, yeah. um, and uh, the possibility of his ever having been redeemed 
either by instruction or simply by having him do that uh, self-referential critical thinking that you defined as thinking. Is there a way of it teaching that? Is... Uh, yeah, and, and somebody like Eichmann. So um, mm. I uh, when I was in college, um, there was a program uh, at Rikers Island uh, mm -hmm. to try to try and get the uh, the adolescent inmates to think. Uh, so we had uh, group talk, and for the most part, uh, they were kind of sullen. Most of them were in there for drugs, yeah. and uh, there wasn't a whole lot of thinking. There, there was maybe spouting off, uh, and I don't think that I was very effective in bringing them to thought. I thought the idea maybe had merit, but um, you know the uh, the idea is one thing, and the uh, the reality, the actuality is another. So, you yeah. know, with with somebody like Eichmann, uh, and there are many others like him. I mean, there are uh, co plenty of careerists, plenty of cowards, and there are people, you know, like Trump who. Um, is is just all for himself. He's a sociopath and he's he's mean, <laughs> you know. So uh, maybe you just have to stand against that type. I think there's um one of my favorite essays. It's actually a lecture. Is um a Ad Ador Theodore Adorno, Adorno and Arendt hated each other, but. Adorno gave a course in Frankfurt on, uh, he gave a series of lectures on the problems of moral philosophy. And he actually he has, he has, a, he has, he has a kind of similar take on this question of thinking that Arendt does, which we, we really see um, fold it, uh, unfold it more in her lectures on Kant. But he says at the beginning, he stands up in front of the class at the beginning of the seminar and he says, if any of you have come here today because you think I'm going to teach you how to live a good life, or right life, you've come to the wrong place. I have, I, I, mean, I have no intention of teaching you that. Um, what I wanna talk about um, is what it means to be a joiner. And he says, the problem today, um, you know, everybody wants, is that everybody wants to be a part of something. Everybody wants to join something. Um, and he calls this the American joiner mentality. But then he says, the problem, the problem arises when people actually want to stop and think about something for a change. Okay. And I think, you know, this is Arendt at the beginning of the human condition, which is ultimately a book about freedom. You know, what I propose is therefore to stop and think what we are doing. And this relationship between thinking and judgment it has a lot to do with the way she's thinking about what it means to be a truth teller, what it means to engage in acts of civil disobedience, um, to have the courage to uh, step back from the goings on of everyday life and political movement um, and social movement in order to uh, critically think about and engage with what it is we're doing um and why we're doing it this seems to be a real problem on the american left to me today in a certain way um i had a student write a paper last week about um it was very frustrated about um you know what if if you step if you if 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 you, if you, if you step outside of the rhetoric the acceptable rhetoric of what's right and what's good and Donald Trump is disgusting and, and everything he does is wrong and you know this is horrible um, then you're unwoke which is the, the phrase that people are using these days um, that you um, you know how you can't you're not allowed to question right you're not allowed to question certain things because they're just taken as facts and aren't really pushes us into a space of unknowingness of, of trying to get us to always question and, and to be critical about what it is we're, we're saying, the language we use to say what we're saying, 
um, and to think about why it is we participate in certain activities and how we take responsibility for that participation. I want to believe that it can be taught, Bob. I think that might be why I became a professor. <laughs> um, but I don't want to teach anyone to think a certain way. I think ideally, you know, when you read these kinds of rich and incre incredible texts that open up language in the world to you in new ways that you're, audit that you're thrust into a space of thinking. Um, and I think hopefully as educators, we can, at our best, we can open up spaces for thinking. Um, and offering our students new new vocabularies and new portraits or frameworks for engaging the world. At the end of the day, it's up to each person to do that themselves. But I think we can try and try and facilitate um, that. I think that's it's it's difficult because it also means accepting that you know we're all individuals, which for RN is the essence of freedom. You know, we live in a plural society and, you know, we can sit and maybe disagree about the question of moral responsibility, you know, forever. And, you know, I, I might think what you're saying is fundamentally wrong and you might think what I'm saying is fundamentally wrong, but we can have a conversation and push each other to think. Um, and we can, uh, you know, have a certain sense of fidelity to self that way um, while respecting others and their right to think. That's not a very satisfactory answer. You guys are no. asking tough questions today. Uh, I'm, uh, this is Howard. Hi. I'm, uh, hi, I'm, Howard. Hi, how are you? I'm good. Uh, I, I'm, I'm in a totalitarian society or government, uh, perhaps the rent is right. Perhaps the best that you can do is to uh, consciously think, as she argues at the end of, of, of the essay, and yep. make a judgment based upon that thought. But in other types of society, which are certainly more prevalent, uh, I'm wondering if that's not just the first step, and whether it's not crucial then to, to share those thoughts, and whether the ultimate judgment is a result of the sharing as opposed to just the thinking. What do you, can you say more about what you mean by sharing those thoughts and what how you're in, seeing that? Yeah, I mean some type of a a public sphere. It doesn't have to encompass the the. It, it may just be your own friends or uh, people in your community or people in an organization that you're a part of, uh, in which you uh, talk about important issues, not just saying this is good and this is bad and isn't it horrible and. Uh, and throwing up your hands, but but uh, uh, making judgments, making uh, 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 coming up with solutions, even though you know they're inadequate, and throwing them out for uh, discussion and to get feedback, and yeah. uh, and and then eventually getting to the point where you have enough of this interchange of judgments. Uh, to be uh, come up with what Fraser calls a good enough solution, uh, which lasts for the moment until it, you know, deconstructs because there's always unknowns that you've not been able to consider and things like that. Yeah, and I think I think in a certain sense, this idea of critical engagement with oneself and with others is what Arun is holding up against the usual lesser of two evils. Right, which we see appear in American political discourse all of the time, usually during presidential elections, <laughs> which um, I remember when uh, Bush and Kerry were running for office and there was this, it, this conversation was everywhere. These are two bad choices among the kind of left liberal um, academic community. And Arendt says, you know, so what people forget when they make the argument that you have to choose, that you have a moral imperative to choose the lesser of two evils, is that you're still choosing evil, right? 
And in that choosing, you are supporting, right? We are citizens who exist in a society and choices are put before us. And we, instead of stepping back and engaging with those choices and where those choices are coming from and, and demanding different, better choices, we automatically fall prey to this kind of logic where it appears that this is the solution or this is so the solution and neither is ideal, but this one's a little better, so I'll support that one. And Arendt is trying to push us out of that logical fallacy politically um, so that we can take responsibility for our choices. So my, my question would be, mm. how do you distinguish between choosing between two evils and this is the best we can do. I think that, that in any judgment, you have to acknowledge that it's not perfect. At least I, that's my limitation. I don't know, I can't speak for everyone else. But uh, uh, so I, you know, I guess if you had a clear line of what's evil and what's not evil, uh, but that doesn't exist either. I, I think we do end up in a situation, I don't know whether or not, I mean, the use of the word uh, the phrase choosing between two evils is the kind of cliche that can be used politically in debate and things like that. But from a real perspective, uh, it seems to me that what we're stuck with is we got to make the best judgment that we can, knowing that it's not a perfect judgment. And we and have to is Aaron is trying to get you to interrogate that that question of judgment itself. She's saying that that um dichotomy between the better and worse judgment is a kind of political illusion that at the end of the day allows us to abdicate personal responsibility and whenever we go along with that and make that kind of judgment we're still supporting what's wrong if we cannot fully support either and think either is right um, so it draws in, in part into question the nature of a political system that is constantly putting before us this form of option, right? I wanna, there are a couple of um, questions in the chat box. Dina, he said, Aaron seems to stop short of saying that we have an affirmative duty not to partici participate in public life under dictatorship. Does this mean that the act of omission, i.e. the failure to object or disobey immoral, is it enough not to participate or are we assuming we think in the Arendtian sense duty bound object? Do you want to tease that out for us a little, Dina? Are you still, still here? Oops, I don't know what I did. Oh, she doesn't have a mic. Okay. So let me just, let me look at it one more time. Does the, that the failure to object or disobey is immoral. Is it enough not to participate? Is it enough not to participate? Are we assuming we think in the Arendtian? I'm, I'm not sure what you mean by duty bound to object. If you could, if you could maybe type something about that. I think this, I think this plays off of um, the question that Willa raised earlier. Um, I think the word she means is, are we duty bound to object? Oh, a to object. I'm reading, I'm reading it as object, which is my, thank you. Thank you. Um, I don't know if, she, I, I think I, my sense is yes. I think that she wants to say if we, um, if we are going to take personal responsibility um, for our judgments and our actions um, and to think about what it means to judge and by which standards we are judging um, and a, that we have, a, we have a moral responsibility to thinking, to critical thinking. Um, I'm not sure if that answers um, 
your question. Does somebody else want to? <clears throat> I think we went over this before. We can come back to it if you want. Um, John writes, we're living neither under totalitarianism nor dictatorship. But what Arendt says about moral choices, the fallacies of collective guilt and collective innocence, I find relevant to the history and plight of African Americans in our white dominated society. I agree that whites like me shouldn't feel collective guilt for slavery, but how should I feel about the benefits I continue to enjoy that resulted from past and present act actions by whites? And what should I be doing about this if I'm going to make moral choices? Take the issue of reparations. I support them, not necessarily, especially in significant and substantial ways, for instance, in making public education in African American communities as close as possible to what whites have. This would obviously require major changes in public policy at all levels of society. John, do you want to add something to that? Okay. Um, yeah, this question arose for me too as I was rereading the essay. I think that it's um, become a part of our public discourse over the last few years with the emergence of the Black Lives Matter movement even more than it has been in recent history. Um, if, we're re if we're thinking about the question through Arendt's text, she would say that we as individuals um, cannot feel personally guilty um, for the sins of our fathers, um, which is the phrase she uses. Um, but the other question at play is how do we take um, personal responsibility for something that we as individuals judge to be wrong and how do we um, how do how is it that we make that judgment um, I'm not sure that I don't have a good answer to this question um, I think that there oh, you know we can link okay. there John, do you want to add something? I was just going to say, you know, we can make personal choices in our personal, you know, relationships, but I'm wondering whether a rant would be urging us to act, act to more at the political level, you know, when we're dealing with moral choices in this area. I, I think the question of political reparations for African Americans in the United States is a political question. Um, there might be instances I can imagine where it would become a personal question, but in terms of um, it, in terms of politics, it's a matter of, of public policy um, and something that, that would have to be. I believe it appears on the House floor every year um, and is routinely um, shot down. Um, there, I'm trying to imagine, um, you know, how I might begin to think about this through an Arendtian lens, and I think that she would still raise the question of the problem of history and how it is that we try to hold history accountable um, through um, social through social means. Um, and for her, there is a kind of failure embedded in that, um, and in the essay that we read for today, in the sense that it defers individual responsibility, um, but also that you can't judge the whole of history. Um, what political work would it be that reparations are doing? What problems are they addressing? Um, it's not something that I, I personally have spent a lot of uh, time thinking about, and I, I wish I had a better answer for you. Does somebody else want to um, offer an answer to that question? I think it's an excellent question, and it presents a lot of um, a I, lot of moral questions. I wanted to um, just say that and? I think we may we may not be able to hold history accountable. But I think learning the history um, in Charlottesville, uh, I'm working on uh, ways of getting the history of what happened in Charlottesville to the black community into public awareness, into the schools. They mowed down the entire 
uh, hub of the black community in, in urban renewal, then left it sitting for 20 years until they built a Staples and an Omni Hotel. And people walk the mall every single day and have no clue. So I yeah. think that, um, you know, it's, it's important to first learn that history and, and begin talking about that history, even though you can't reverse it, um, yeah. at least to become aware of it and to educate ourselves um, about that history. And of course, now in Charlottesville, there's some people actually thinking about that since what happened this summer uh, started to uh, get people more aware. Yeah. Can yeah. I offer something? Margaret, yeah. Yeah. Um, and I was just thinking about the situation in the last couple of years in Germany and the notion that, okay, so if you grew up post-war, you grew up post-war, you were not there during the war, and we've already just discussed some of, uh, you know, what, what Arendt would say about collective guilt or lack thereof, but the idea that you basically, you effectuate your thinking by turning to a crisis of today and dealing with it in a certain way that is informed by your knowledge of history. You can't mm -hmm. go backwards. You can't change it. Yes, this isn't says you can keep the information from being hidden or try to do that, but isn't the move to then you know, if, if one is to be a morally responsible person by thinking, it means looking at what is today and acting accordingly. I mean, that that isn't supposed to just be intellectual knowledge that, you know, goes into the back of my head and sits there. Um, and so, you know, that yes, okay, we're Germany and bad things happened here, and I know I'm being simplistic, I don't mean to be trite, but, you know, now there is an overarching responsibility, say, to take in refugees precisely because of what wasn't done in the past. And, and I'm wondering, you know, if, if it's more that sort of, sort of idea, because, because you, can't, you can't undo the past. I don't, yeah, I would, I think I, I think I agreed with almost everything you said up to the last to the last sentence. I don't think I don't think the fact of not being able to undo the past becomes the grounding of the moral center that allows us to act in the present moment. I think for Arendt, history one of, one of the um, incredible things about the origins of totalitarianism is that she says in no way did this have to happen. The Holocaust did not have to happen. And people who write history books about the Holocaust write it in such a way that they assume that this was some kind of natural outcome of the events of history, which is why she writes it in her history, which is not really a history, and this other constellating way where she draws together the various elements that crystallized together in order that, that, that opened up the ground for the phenomenal appearance of totalitarianism as an event in history. Um, and in that way, she's constantly, I think, pushing us to engage with the various elements that are at play in the societies in which we live. And, and that's a very material, historical history. Um, and it's not given, right? So it's, it's moving. And in the sense that it's moving, it doesn't provide a firm ground on which we can stand and then make personal or political decisions. Um, the other part of what you were saying it, about um, coming face to face with, I think is absolutely right. Um, she said she wanted to go to Jerusalem to attend the trial of Adolf Eichmann because she wanted to see a Nazi in the flesh and to come face to face with him. Um, there, that I think that has greater philosophical import. Um, it means that we have to come face to face with the reality of the world we live in, even if it's not a pretty reality. And oftentimes the political language that is given or that we use to talk about the situations we find ourselves in is not 
wholly reflective of the reality in which we live, but is reflective of the political arguments people are making for how they would like reality to be, or how they would like us to see what's going on. And in, in taking apart the different elements, Arendt wants us, Arendt, I think, is giving us a form or a way to think about how it is that something like the Holocaust might have happened. Um, I don't know if you saw what happened in Poland this week, which is another good example of this, but this horrendous bill was signed that makes it illegal and punishable to implicate any Polish citizen um, in, in being complicit with uh, the, the Holocaust. Um, and to, the, they're not allowed to talk about it. It's an, it's an act of erasure, an act of um, erasure, which for Arendt um, is very um, symbolic of totalitarianism in itself in a certain way, which is very dangerous. Um, there are a number of Dina. I just want to grab on Dina. You um, t you said if we go back to your question, if we do have a duty to object and disobey, is it immoral not to object? So I think Arendt, Arendt wants to get us away from this language of is it moral, is it immoral, um, and reorient us toward a concept of what it means to think and to judge. We have to break in a society where something like the Holocaust is possible. Morality is no longer good enough as the basis or ground from which we can make judgments. And if we can no longer look toward morality, um, then we have to look towards something else. And for her, it's this relationship between thinking and judging, which means that we have a duty to interrogate what is moral, what society tells us is good. So an easy example of this would, to go, it would be to go back to the immigration example that Susan brought up. Um, you know, Donald Trump says that immigrate, Im <laughs> deporting immigrants my, I'm sorry if my head cold is getting in the way of the conversation. <laughs> Donald Trump says that deporting immigrants who are here illegally is good for America, right? He says that this is a good, that's a moral judgment. And we in, have a responsibility to question what this good means, right? Because this good, I think, I assume from the tone of this conversation, it's not good for most of us. It's it, it's it's horrendous and it's very scary uh, politically, and it has extreme consequences for the personal lives of many individuals. And how do we then, as citizens, judge this act that our government and what our president is doing? beyond the moral framework of this is good for America or this is bad for America? How do we break away from those standards of judgment in our contemporary society um, and, and judge better in a certain sense um, in a way that allows us to become civil disobedients um, and skeptics and outlaws? I think that better answers your question, Dina. I hope so. You can let me know if it doesn't. Um, Daphna writes, in a world where the Donald Trumps, <laughs> we, can, we can only escape so far. In a world where the Donald Trumps can rise to such position, such a position, is it not that the values and morals of humanity have so completely <laughs> been corrupted or diverted into a simplistic world where rich is good, white is good, and I don't see the point of critical thinking at all. Well, there's, I can't remember who, who said it, but somebody, somebody said, you know, what, what appears, what appears normal is actually insane and what is insane appears completely normal. And I think to a certain extent, we've been living in a reality like that for quite a while, but that's my personal opinion, um, as Samantha. Um, <laughs> I mean, I think the hard part about the question you raise here, Daphna, about Donald Trump in the context of American politics is that a lot of people genuinely, genuinely um, believe that Donald Trump is good, that he is good for America. Um, 
they feel alienated and disaffected by our political institutions and in him they see their interest being represented and i think that there that that in itself and the number of people who voted for him forces us to step back and and to critically think about why that is why that is and why it is that so many of us want to say well no this is just fundamentally wrong right this actually takes us back to the beginning of the essay um, where Arendt says that one of the reasons people responded so harshly to the book Eichmann was because that they were where is they were um let me find the the right word go ah. right that they were that they were in sitting that they were sitting in judgment over what was happening and that they were in some way being motivated in their judgment from 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 a place of I think she uses the word not um, sentiment right um, that we get angry right we hear our, we hear political arguments and we see certain public policies being enacted and it moves something in us affectively and from that place of being affected we make um, individual judgments um, and she wants to say that this is part of the reason why people were so angry that she was judging Eichmann the man and not um, and not what had happened more broadly um and in that i mean we it's a she's she's turning us away from making judgments political judgments from a place of affect from feeling and sentiment toward a place of thinking and reason right um it's very difficult not to just be angry at Trump voters, <laughs> right? I think a lot of people would say, um, but we have to step back and hear what they have to say and engage with them and realize that they have legitimate points of view, um, individuals who have a politics that might be very different from ours um, or somebody else's, um, but are not without, not, not necessarily without reason. On the other side of that, I mean, I, a lot of people become supporters of political candidates or political movements. Trump says he's leading a movement um, without engaging in critical thinking. Um, they want to be a part of something, right? Um, and that's sticky territory um, about how we begin to judge others. Right? Anne wrote, we just hosted Reverend Eugene Rivers at our college who spoke on this particular question, on the question of rep reparations, I think is when you type this, um, this question in. Um, he's done a lot of work on the topic and suggested how to respond on the political level. Do you want to say something about that, Anne? Yeah. Uh, can you guys hear me? Yes. Um, so what he said, he was coming um, to speak since it's Black History Month, and um, there's actually a question about reparations and if he thinks, um, given all the work that he's done with all the travels and um, his own personal history, um, if he thinks that reparations is <coughs> a good way to respond, um, especially to the question about, you know, feeling guilty for the benefits that we do receive given our history in America. Um, and he had two responses, um, or two, I guess, like suggestions or reasons why he doesn't think that reparations are a good idea. Um, he said that one, it's just too divisive because um, it, yeah, it almost like looks down on 
the people who have um, black Americans and anyone else who has suffered from um, that time in our history. But then the other really just like building off of that, the second point he gave is that it, um, it really just picks out a scab and it makes the situation worse. And so what he suggested instead of reparations is ensuring, and this was really um, getting at what we were saying earlier about how we apply um, what we have seen through history and like learn how to improve today so that we treat everyone um, with dignity and uphold morality. And that is making sure that our systems today are just um, and that they're being, not just that they're just, but that they're being justly um, instituted and applied to everyone. Um, so that, yeah, it was just interesting that he spoke about that in light of this conversation that it came up. And it was also surprising because I have been personally in favor of reparations, even though I don't really know how we, um, how to go about that in a fair way to make sure that everyone receives what they, um, yeah, what they should receive. Um, so that was surprising, but again, his advice that he gave, um, given his work. Thank you for sharing that. Does somebody want to add on at all? Um, I'll strike a blow for the practical. Um, okay. In the uh, in the discussion about the lesser of evils, uh, oftentimes. Um, it's not exactly a lesser of an evil. It's a, a less of a of a choice uh, uh, that we would like to make. And in terms of uh, reparations, you know, the consequences are vast. We've been talking about uh, Trump supporters, and even though I I'm someone with a temper, I realize that. Uh, if I'm engaging in a political discussion with somebody with whom I disagree, uh, in the back of my mind is the concept that not only am I trying to express myself, I'm trying to convince that person. And you don't convince the person, you know, by standing on formality or credential or uh, denigrating their position. If that's what you're going to do, don't even bother talking to them. You'll just drive them further away. And I think um, reparations, practically speaking, um, would, like this uh, this minister said, not only uh, pick on a scab, uh, but would be a loser. You know, if uh, to the extent that, uh, let's say, the Democratic Party adopts it, they will drive themselves further into a corner. <clears throat> but certainly something that Arendt emphasizes is the need to engage with um, arguments and not with um, the, the way in which individuals make arguments through ad hominem attacks. Right? Um, and I think that's, that can be incredibly um, challenging, especially when one doesn't see how the other person is using logic or reason in making the arguments that they're making, um, which is something I'm sure we've all experienced. Um, I want to go back to the, get through the rest of the questions. In the last essay in Responsibility and Judgment, entitled The Deputy, I believe Arndt explores the failure of the Pope to speak out against the massacre of the Jews. Rhea, did you want to say something about that? Uh, thanks. I haven't actually read it. I was, um, I read about it in the introduction and it, it piqued my interest, but I, I haven't read it. Maybe you could comment on it? I haven't read it in that essay in a few years, so I don't think that I can comment on, on it um, in, uh, in, in the way that you in the way that you want. Um, 
I would have to go back and look at the essay. If you send me an email, I'm happy to I'm happy to do that and go back and look at it. Um, and then Dina writes, not sure you answered my question. OK, I think the essay leaves unanswered whether we have a responsibility to disobey. Absolutely, the essay leaves open um, the question of whether or not we have a responsibility to disobey because Arendt wants you to get there yourself, I think. She's not going to tell you that you have to do this or you have to do that, which was kind of the point I was trying to make with the Adorno lecture story. Um, if you come to an essay on personal responsibility, you're not going to find, um, you know, like a 10 point kind of, um, you know, check off list, you know, do this, do this, do this, and you must do this as a kind of immoral, a moral imperative about how you have to act in the world. Um, I think that, you know, aren't, aren't the way that Arendt paints it is, you know, look, we have people who chose not to participate in any way in the totalitarian society, and we have people like Eichmann who chose to participate in the society. And so why did they choose to act the way that they did? And the discernible difference that Arendt sees between those two forms of, of people um, is thinking, right? The, the former wanted to think, she says, and, and the latter refused to think. They were incapable of thinking. Um, and that's a radical claim. I mean, that's not an easy, that's not an easy um, argument to make, I think, that, that those people who, who resisted becoming complicit in what was happening, they wanted to think. Right? Um, that is a question of personal responsibility, of individual responsibility, and it's, she, it's a judgment that Arendt is making, that she's making about individuals' actions and about the language that they use and about the way in which they decide to, to, to act amongst others in the world. Um, it's um, it's a provocation. It's not a solution. And I, I think that's one of the reasons why Arendt, at least for me, always, always uh, remains as an interlocutor in the, ba in the back of my head when I'm thinking about political questions, because she, she doesn't just tell you, you know, well, this is, um, you know, this is, this is how it was, right? There are attempts at understanding but in order to begin to understand, we have to first think about the difference between understanding and comprehension. And we can't just tell the history of how something came to be. We have to think about all of the different elements that are at play that created the ground for something to come into existence in the first place. She constantly remains in that open space of thinking, um, which is why she's truly an individual thinker and why she's unique and refuses categorization um, and to, to say this is right and you have an absolute moral responsibility to do this would be verging on ideological and she stays very very far away from that in all of her writing um, she's not um, and she doesn't I think she's really wrestling with what this complete collapse of moral categories did to society. Um, we lost the banisters um, uh, for, for, for judgment, um, right? I think Roger, Roger um, edited the volume Thinking Without a Banister, which is a phrase that she uses. Um, how is it that we think without a banister? How is it that we think without the normative moral conceptual categories of judgment that we want to rely upon in day-to-day -day life when something extraordinary is happening in the society in which we live. And others, does the, it, did I get closer, Dina? It's not, not gonna be a, not gonna be a, <laughs> the answer you wanted probably. Willa said, um, uh, how to undo societal and political structural racism, inequality, etc. 
I'm not I'm not sure what you're oh, okay. uh, ultimately isn't uh, that the uh, that the isn't that the issue at bottom of what we've been talking about we have a society that um, in America you mean in, in America yes I'm sorry um, the uh, the ultimate end of enlightenment thinking which I learned from you um, uh, what action do we take to undo what's built into it yeah yeah I mean that's it's it's an excellent question um, and you're asking me to put on my critical theory Adorno and Benjamin um, hat and take off my Arendt hat in order to answer it which um, I'm, 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 a little hes I'm a little hesitant to do in the context of this conversation. Um, but I, I mean, I think, at, I think something that I can say at bottom is that one way in which we begin to address the, soci the, 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 the societal um, inequalities and justices that we see unfolding around us is by learning how to come face to face with the world that we live in and to um, engage our engage in this form of self-reflective critical thinking and in turn be very conscious of the language that we use to um, make political arguments and to engage in um, these kinds of political conversations in other words to see the world um, for what it is and how it is um, and not you know this is why um, it's so important not to say well Americans a totalitarian society right America isn't a totalitarian society um, it, but if we go around saying that um, and making political arguments from that presumption then what we're saying is not reflective of the reality that we're living in it's much more complicated um, and nuanced and we have to be attentive to that which requires more a lot a lot more thinking um, and research and engagement um, oftentimes we just want to you know get the line on something and get to the end of it and say well you know this is the problem um, but that's hardly ever just the problem there's usually a lot of other things going on you know it's not just Trump right um, there are, <laughs> for example um, you know, if Mike Pence became president, we'd, we'd have all the same problems and probably a few more. Um, there are a lot of different elements at play to use, to use Arendt's language. Um, we are at the end of the discussion. Um, I, Dina, you came back in and said, uh, you're trying to get another distinction between non-participation and disobeying. Yes, so Arendt is drawing a distinction between, um, I would say, supporting and obeying to offer the, the flip side of that distinction. Um, and to think about the language we use when we're asking someone to take responsibility for their actions. Do we ask them, why did you obey? Or what, do we ask them, why did you support? And she's arguing that there's a fundamental um, distinction between those two words in terms of responsibility. Um, so obeying means that um, you were a non-thinking cog in uh, the machine, um, that you were just performing your part, um, that you were going along with it because that's what you were told to do and you were being a good citizen. And supporting means that you were um, actively taking a part in. Um, it wasn't possible that Eichmann was just a cog in the machine. Um, and that's why that defense would never, would never stand. Um, so disobeying um, then I think I think she earlier in the text she's using it she's at the end she's using it in a different way in order to think about how do we act outside of the extant legal order right how do we disobey the law um, when the law is um, totalitarian right Unfortunately, I think we're five minutes over. Um, this was a really 
This was a really provocative conversation. Um, I apologize for the sniffling. Um, and if there was uh, confusions, um, we will meet again next week um, to read another essay um, from this book, um, some questions of moral philosophy. Dan, is that right? Can you, or I'm sorry, we're reading Thinking and Moral Considerations. I had it open to some questions of moral philosophy. We're reading Thinking and Moral Considerations. Um, for our next reading. And then um, I think we'll put up the new schedule soon and slide into um, Jerome Cohn's newly vol edited volume um, on political freedom. Thank you everyone for a great discussion. And I'll see you next week.